The previous video defined limits. They are the central technical tool of calculus, the thing that will eventually allow us to understand the complex, dynamically changing systems that calculus aims to understand. Having defined limits, I need to talk about how to calculate limits. This video will be general. I'm going to go over the approach to calculating limits, the strategies and tools. Then, in the next video, I'll do examples to show how the strategy actually works in practice. There is a three-step approach. First, I try to evaluate the function at the limit point. For many functions, this will be sufficient, since the thing that the function approaches is just the function value. The limit is still about approach, but it can happen that the approach and then the actual value are the same. Second, if I can't just evaluate the point, then I'll look to do some kind of logical analysis of the pieces of the limit. If it is a fraction, I'll look at the numerator and denominator. If it is an exponent, I'll look at the base and the exponents. If I know what the pieces are doing, I can sometimes make a good conclusion on where the whole thing is going. And I'll show how this works out in examples in the next video. Finally, if both of these fail, then the limit is called an indeterminate form. I'll say more about indeterminate forms next week as well. For indeterminate forms, I'm going to need some kind of algebraic manipulation to try and change the function so that I can understand the limit. And again, I'll show how this works in examples in the next video. When approaching limits, you should try these three rules in this order. The second step, the logical analysis, involved looking at the pieces of the limit, and the third step involved algebraic manipulations. In both of these steps, it will be important to know how limits interact with the usual operations of arithmetic and algebra. The good news here is that limits interact pretty well with all of these operations. Here are, collectively, what I'll call the limit laws, much like, say, the exponential laws are rules that govern how exponents interact with other algebraic operations. These laws tell me that I can split up limits over multiplication, division, and exponentiation. All of these work as long as the limits on the right exist. If you split up a limit but the individual pieces don't exist, then the rules no longer work, of course. There's a lot of text on this slide, but it is easily summed up with the idea that limits work nicely with arithmetic operations. The first of these three can be grouped together. Any operation in mathematics that interacts well with addition, subtraction, and multiplication by constants is called a linear operation. This is a pretty useful term, so I wanted to mention it here. Limits are linear because they have these first three properties. One last thing before ending this general discussion of approaches to limits. Often, when using the limit laws or other manipulations, I can boil complicated limits down to simpler ones. There are a number of limits known to mathematicians. You can think of these as basic building blocks that help understand more complicated limits. The two most important of them are here on the slide. These are both indeterminate forms by themselves. I can't evaluate, and I can't just look logically to see what is going on. You can simply reference these and use them in your calculations. The first is the best tool for any limits that involve both trigonometry and polynomials. The second will be used less frequently, but is valuable for certain kinds of exponential limits. The second is also one of the definitions of the special number e. I promised that this number would show up frequently in calculus and prove its worth. Here is the first instance. Much like pi is a very useful number that originally is defined by circle geometry, e is a very useful number that depending on your perspective, can be originally defined as the value of this special limit.